A welcome to you all. Um, my name is Yuri Aplo. I'm the artistic director of POST. Um, I'm pleased to welcome you all to this online conversation, Undocumented uh, Past and Present Relations. Um, in the context of the exhibition, Nucleus of Capital. And today we'll be joined uh, by Minna Hendrickson, Emma Bulukao Wanamwa, uh, Nina Stotrop Larsen, and of course the curator of the exhibition, Anja Bitkina. If you're not familiar with uh, POST, POST is an interlocal platform for contemporary art, which is operating from Arnhem and Nijmegen. And our main focus is to bring urgent and uh, engaging voices to the foreground uh, and to provide a space for experimental art practices and stimulate translocal exchanges and collaboration in particularly within the 025 region. And for now, I'm very happy to uh, introduce the curator of the exhibition, but also who will be our moderator for today, uh, Anja Bitkina. Um, she's a curator of visual contemporary art, performative projects and educational programs. In her curatorial practice, she connects theory, social science, history, philosophy, in order to generate knowledge about contemporary reality in its social political conditions. Anna is co-founder of TOC, a curatorial collective uh, and research-based art organization founded uh, together with Maria Feitz in uh, 2010. And in 2020, TOC was the winner of the Apex Art Open Call Award. And uh, in the fall in 2021, TOC will be curating the main exhibition at the Photo Mont uh, in Biennale. In Tallinn. So thank you very much. Welcome to you all. And uh, I will now give the word to uh, Anya. Welcome and uh, please. Hi, everyone. Uh, hello. I'm uh, really happy that uh, we all convened in a, such a wonderful company today, together with Nina Strutrup Larsen and Mina Henriksen and uh, Emma Belukau Vanamba. And um, it's, um, it's a really great pleasure to. Uh, introduce and conversate with all of you. So we all get together in the, um, uh, as Yuri already said, in the uh, occasion of uh, exhibition, Nucleus of Capital, which is an uh, exhibition uh, which present the results of uh, uh, Nina's project um, and uh, research. And uh, today's event is an um, um, accompanying public event, uh, which is conceptualized the uh, main idea of, uh, uh, of the exhibition. Nina Stadtrup Larsen exhibition, Nucleus of Capital, is a part of her ongoing artistic investigation about European power structures and racial capitalism. The, uh, by looking at the um, uh, particular history and current state of uh, such currency as a uh, CFA franc, uh, which is a currency uh, in uh, um, uh, 14 states in Western uh, and Central Africa, Nina is investigating post-colonial present, past and present um, in the EU. And also looking at the different processes that are happening in, um, in economical uh, power structures of um, uh, European Union, but um, uh, in a closer focus on the subcurrency CFA, CFA francs, uh, which is um, um, uh, still um, very much controlled and uh, printed and um, managed by, by France, uh, but which is, um, um, uh, which is a former um, colony uh, of the, uh, which is a former colonizer of um, Central and um, uh, West Africa. Today, um, and, uh, we decided as a part of the um, uh, exhibition, which is like really unveiling very important and uh, not very known uh, details about uh, European uh, economy and European uh, past and present, we decided to invite uh, several artists that working with um, um, historical and uh, 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 with uh, matters that are very much connected to a known uh, European past and uh, uh, look at their methods and uh, look at their um, agenda and uh, aims uh, which they are following uh, during their uh, practice. Um, 
Today, our event uh, uh, called the Undocumented Past and Present Relations, um, as I mentioned, um, uh, gathered together three artists, Mina Hendrickson, Anna Valukao Vanamba, and Nina Stoutrup Larsson. And all of them in their practice deal in with issues related to undocumented, hidden or contested uh, past. They work with different cases of social, economical, and colonial uh, histories of Europe uh, in order to trace their consequences in the present uh, and also in the uh, not distant future. Uh, during our discussion, we will try to um, put in the center uh, different, uh, uh, different matters connected to contested history, also to the um, uh, question connected to national history, building up archives uh, and um, how artists um, are dealing in their practice with uh, such issues like uh, canceled past and how do they see their practice uh, contribute to the um, uh, understanding of uh, particularities of contemporary reality. Um, the format of our conversation uh, and discussion will be like this. Uh, we will give a uh, floor uh, for about 10 minutes to each artist, and then uh, we will engage in a conversation between each other, but also very much open to different questions uh, uh, to our audience. And uh, um, we will welcome questions uh, that you can write in the uh, in the uh, chat section and uh, I will uh, read them out to the speakers. So we will start uh, uh, from uh, Mina Hendrickson. Um, I'm very happy to welcome you Mina and um, uh, Mina is a visual artist based in Helsinki and um, uh, she has been uh, in her practice dealing with um, issues connected to nation nationalism and uh, Finnish citizenship policy that she tackles uh, through different social structures uh, like national and historical archives, policies towards different minorities uh, in the region, in the Nordic region, migration, changing migration policy, uh, she usually conducts her research together with sociologists and historians. And um, uh, as a part of her practice, uh, she's very much um, uh, looking um, in details into how national archives are constructed. And often she comes up with her own alternative uh, understanding and formats of uh, archives. Um, uh, her works uh, relate to the anti-racism, uh, left, left and feminist struggle. And uh, Mina is also very much um, touch, uh, focusing her practice with the history of socialism in Finland. And uh, also uh, looking at the position, particular peculiar position of Finland during the uh, Cold War time. Um, so Nina, the uh, floor is yours. We'll be really happy to uh, hear, um, um, like, a, I mean, your practice is very extended, but uh, if you will give us an example, maybe of your recent work of those which uh, you think fit the most uh, to the content of today's event. Hello, everybody, and thank you very much uh, for inviting me here. And thank you, Anna, for this introduction. And actually, while listening to it, I some other projects came to my mind that I maybe should have <laughs> included here, but but I, I I I put together a few slides and I even kind of prepared um, a short maximum ten minutes um, introduction to my practice. So we can start. So I will start by sharing uh, my slides. Um, here you see them. Yep. Yeah. So so yes, I'm visual artist, and um, and as artist, I am uh, uh, quite invested in questioning national narratives and looking for hidden histories. And uh, I'm especially interested in underlying ideologies behind historical events and political movements. And uh, living in Europe. Uh, and I've been living actually in, in Finland 
I am originally also from Finland, but but I I was living elsewhere and and came back some 10, 11 years ago. So especially after that, trying to understand the kind of the privileged position of Finland and and of all of Europe on a global scale, for example, why uh, 87% of COVID-19 vaccines have gone to the wealthiest countries, while low-income countries received just 0.2%. So this is just an example of how privileged um, place we live in. So here one cannot avoid having to consider the history of Europe to find the underlying reasons for this privilege. And very soon one is faced with the broad history of colonialism that has its continuities in today, as we can see in Nina's work, um, which demonstrates it very clearly. Um, but somehow the Nordic countries have managed to remain innocent, um, their reputation unspoiled, even though they all have been involved in and benefited from colonialism. And in the uh, Second World War, some were collaborating with the Nazis. Uh, Finland even had a shared expansionist aim with the Nazi Germany toward East. Um, I do not find these histories discussed here in my surroundings. Instead, what I hear is how democratic and exceptionally good the Nordic countries are and have always been. Uh, but uh, it is possible to find the seeds of the European racist ideology in the Nordic countries as well. Uh, my first encounters with this was in early 2010s uh, when I uh, started to find out about the so-called Finnish swastika, uh, which you see here in the picture as well, uh, which uh, was widely used here in, in Finland, especially in the 1920s and 30s. And it is still now in use of national emblems and can be found in the facades of many buildings in certain areas of Helsinki, for example. And when I was reading about the swastika symbol and its uses, uh, in the German Völkisch context, already in the 19th century in Europe, I could see the motivations in the symbols used in, in Finland in the aim to prove that the Finns were also part of the European peoples or the so-called uh, Aryan master race, which they had been excluded from uh, along with the Sami people in those days. Um, uh, but then some, uh, now perhaps some five years ago, I started with a large research-led project commissioned by the Swedish History Museum in Stockholm. And uh, this was a really eye-opening project for me. Um, um, the work, uh, which you see here in the picture, titled Nordic Race Science, uh, is a drawing in, in the form of a mind map. Um, depicting many of the protagonists of race science in the Nordic countries and the central institutions where this pseudoscience was practiced from 1850s to 1945, more or less. Uh, when I was doing research about this topic, uh, uh, at that moment, the history of race science in Sweden was already written about uh, although it was mainly only about one or two of the main uh, protagonists. But the other Nordic countries were much less addressed. Uh, in Finland, uh, still the dominant discourse was about how the Finns had been subject to racializing and uh, wrongly defined as non-Europeans. Uh, but there was much less um, contemporary research about how the Finnish scientists were also racializing others, especially the Sami people. So this is what this uh, work aims to address as well. Uh, this topic was huge and the format of the work 
as a textual drawing was quite limiting. Uh, therefore, over the years, several other works have also emerged from this uh, same research material. And I guess uh, I am still today somehow working on this material to some extent. Um, here is a detail. Uh, but then um, to end this short presentation here with a different kind of approach, I think it is important also to bring out the histories of uh, leftist struggles and especially of struggles that have been won. Um, uh, one of these has been the local boycott in Finland and the other Nordic countries by trade unions uh, against uh, transporting of goods between uh, Nordic countries and the apartheid regime of South Africa. Um, the role of these boycotts was uh, quite significant when considering that, for example, Finland equipped South Africa with one third of its newsprint paper. And this was time before internet uh, and printed media had an entirely different role. Uh, you can say that it was an essential soft weapon in upholding a regime. Uh, in Finland, the common understanding today is that the Finnish state was in the avant-garde of promoting sanctions against, against South African apartheid regime. My aim here was to show that quite the contrary, they were making the apartheid possible and also profiting from it. Thank you. Nina, thank you so much. Uh, today, preparing for the talk, I uh, found your book. Uh, it was so nice to uh, uh, this uh, uh, works on paper, which you just talked about. And it was so great, actually, to touch in hands uh, this, um, uh, this very beautiful um, uh, printing matter, really. And, uh, and then it's, um, it's really working as an as a evidence of uh, absolutely unknown uh, um, uh, economical history of, um, uh, of Finland, uh, which I guess is very much polished and uh, cleaned out from the, uh, any kind of discourse or history books. And uh, of course, from the history of this corporation that I still very much uh, happily, um, uh, uh, happily uh, generating their capital and uh, yeah. So yes. thank you very much. Yeah, we, we're moving to um, uh, to our uh, next speaker, uh, Emma. Can can we Oops. see your vi yeah. video, please? Uh, hi. Hi. Um, yeah, hello. <laughs> uh, Emma Velukawa Vanamba is um, uh, interested in European colonialism in the 19th and 20th century. And in her work, she reflects upon consequences and uh, uh, continues of these histories in the present. And um, Emma is a, a very great in, in, at investigating different elements of colonial governmental policy in different social domains, historical and present, namely in the history of recent or modern traditions of art education uh, in Uganda, which she writes about in her text uh, on Margaret Trouble Schools of Art. It's a first professional school of fine arts uh, uh, of East Africa in uh, uh, Uganda Prorectorate uh, in the 30s. Um, uh, Emma often conducts her research in collaboration with colleagues from uh, very different fields of knowledge uh, in order to think outwards from a uh, somewhat peripheral ethnographical or marginal area of knowledge towards a collective investigation of the connections, uh, resonance, uh, resistance, and possibly sites of transformation. Uh, she studies liter uh, literature in Cambridge University and art at the Slade School of Fine Arts, University Co College of London, and therefore text and image often closely work together in her practice and uh, accompany each other. 
Uh, she is formerly a participant of the Lux Associate Artist Program and a researcher and a former researcher at the Van Eyck uh, Academy. And uh, currently, uh, Emma is a doctorate candidate in the fine arts at the University of Bergen. Emma, the, the uh, floor is yours and be curious uh, which project you're gonna tell us about. Um, okay, goodness. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you for your introduction. Um, it's very hard to um, describe anything in 10 minutes. I guess I will just try to tell you a story and um, you can draw from this what conclusions you may. So um, with no further ado, I'm going to share the screen, the first one. Okay, so in 2011, um, uh, my now friend, the curator, Catherine Peters Clathock, who was running the art gallery at McCarrie University, drew to my attention the fact that the National Archives had set up a huge Flickr account. So this, they have a Flickr account. Um, it's called World Through a Lens. Um, and they collect here, they inherited from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, their photographic collection. Um, and they recatalogued it. And when they put, when they brought them into the National Archive, they then, started to um, promote the images through the internet. Um, this must have been about 2010 that this happened. And I had just started working in Uganda and I was just curious to see what kinds of images were in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs archive. Um, and so anybody can check this, it's, it's online right now. Um, and I, these were the pictures that were there. And I noticed very quickly, um, I don't know if you can see here, um, maybe if I double click on it, um, that these photographs, around two thirds of them, slightly more than two thirds, were taken in prisons in Uganda in what looked to me to be about the 1950s. Um, so, I mean, Luzira prison is still the largest prison in Uganda. And I was going through this, um, oh, where are we? Have I lost myself again? Um, let's see, yeah, Uganda. I was going through, it's 134 pictures that are on this, in this Flickr account. And they're all taken, so many of them were taken in prisons. So prison, prison, prison. Um, and they're also, I also thought they were a bit weird because I was like, how do I know this is a prison if it's not for the fact that it says it's a prison? Um, and these photographs looked incredibly staged. Um, so I was really curious as to what, why, who has prison, who's taking photographs of prisons and how could it be that even though the British were in Uganda for what, nearly a hundred, for a hundred years, that most of the photographs that they have were taken in prisons. So I went to the UK, I mean, a lot of these ones, you see even the ones which don't look like prisons, they're Uganda prisons exhibit, prison industries exhibition. It's very toys made by prisoners, like everything is prisons. So I went to the UK, um, I'll just go back to the one, uh, one of these ones from up here. Yeah, so I went to the UK National Archive in Kent to look at the entirety of the collection to see if um, <clears throat> this was a representative sample or there was just some kind of weird reason that they had decided to mainly put photographs of prisons in the 1950s onto the internet. I was told by the photographic curator that actually it was the marketing department that had chosen the images, not them. And, um, but much to my surprise, there did indeed seem to be um, a majority of prison photographs um, in the UK National Archives, which was very puzzling. Um, there was no documentation 
um, along with these photographs. So no one knew why they were, they were um, why they had been taken. But what was interesting to note is that you can just about tell from this, they're all take, they're all very large. The photographs are all about this big. Um, they were taken with large format cameras. They have titles on the front, most of them, many of them in English. On the back, there's titles written in English, French, and Portuguese. And on many of the images, you can see um, little holes like here where, um, where drawing pins have been put through. So there was clearly some kind of exhibition. Someone somewhere was going to look at photographs of prisons. They hadn't simply been taken for the archive. So anyway, I, um, I then, um, <clears throat> I'm gonna share some other things now. Um, where are we? I constantly lose my thought. Okay, let's try. Yeah, let's try here. Um, right. Can you see a picture of the prison? Okay, cool. So um, <clears throat> this is a prison. Again, this is hilarious picture for a prison. The door is open. Um, they have a bunch of flowers. Um, they have a radio. There's Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip are on the wall and every single person is reading a book. I mean, there's something very peculiar about this image. Um, but there was no information to be gathered from the UK National Archives. I also went to the Uganda National Archives. Um, these are just close-ups from when I went to look at the collections in person. Um, and there was nothing, I'm gonna come back to that. Um, there was nothing that could be, that I could see anyway. So I was in the art gallery at Makere University. Let's see if I can, in the library, I'm just gonna go down in the library. And I saw this catalog on a shelf. This must've been 2012. Um, it was a catalog for an exhibition that had been held at the McCary Art Gallery in 1963. Um, and it was just lying on a shelf in the library. Um, I photographed it because in Uganda, it's much quicker to photograph than it is to make photocopies. Um, and but the reason I did that is because it was clear to me that at least that this picture, these two pictures, here had been were copies of the photographs of the prisons that I'd seen in the Flickr account. I recognized them as drawings that were copying these photographs. So I thought, well, here is somebody who's who's definitely, let's see where I can find them, because I do have examples here. Let me just zoom out. Um, it was clear that this person had seen the prison photographs. It was completely obvious. And then I was trying to find out which artists had made them because 1960s catalogs are not replete with information. Um, I spent about a year thinking it was a woman in Tanzania. Um, I tried to get hold of the man who curated the exhibition who must be in his 90s, but is still alive. Um, that he was not responding to anything. I saw what looked like his daughter's name on a, um, on a website making documentaries in Uganda. I thought it was worth a try. I emailed her and said, who, who is, you know, who made this, who made this, um, these paintings? Um, and she said, oh, that's Ignatius Cerulio. He lives just up the hill. Here's his phone number. And so this is Ignatius here. Um, I went to meet him. He had some, but not all of the series of paintings. Um, and it turned out that when he was in his first year at the Art Academy, the Colonial Prison Service arrived and said they wanted to commission someone to make a series of paintings celebrating the Colonial Prison Service. And these paintings, the series of paintings were going to be shown at the Speak Centenary Festival. The Speak Festival was um, organized by the British government um, to, um, as part of their farewell celebrations, their farewell to Uganda. And um, they, and so it was a bit like a trade fair um, and the pr prison service wanted these paintings to 
show the wonderful work that they've done. He rescued them from the prison in the 1970s, his paintings, which is why he still has them. But he said that he was allowed to go to the prison, I think for two or three days. And at one point they just stuck him in a room with this box of photographs. And so that was that that was kind of um, that was where this came from. I mean, I was I continued to be very I, I know I haven't got a lot of time left. I am. Um, can, at this time, I was asked by Savi in Berlin um, if I would do if I would present some of this research into colonial prison photography. Um, and I I I really wrestled with this as a as an invitation. Um, was very unsure because I didn't have any information about the images. I think they're really complicated photographs and they're very fascinating, but I was worried about their, about what, it, what the consequences of not knowing their provenance was. Um, and then around that time um, is when the UK was, no, 2011, but it didn't become relevant to me to 2013. Um, in, 2000 and, in 2009, a group of former Mau Mau took the British government to court um, to accusing them of having committed acts of torture in their suppression of the uprising in, in what's now Kenya in 1954. Their lawyers subpoenaed files um, that they said would demonstrate that the torture had been orchestrated at a government level. Um, initially, the British government said that there was no documentation, these files, these records didn't exist, but there were a group of um, colonial historians and also some civil servants working in the ministry who were convinced that this wasn't the case. And so they spent a year and a half searching. Um, what they found after a year and a half was a collection of 9,000 files that had been hidden in a secret service um, installation about 60 kilometers outside London. And what these files reveal that as part of their preparation for, ind for independence in every single colony, they systematically destroyed their archives. This, um, so, and they did this to ensure um, that, there, that there was no, there was no, um, I don't know if you can, I have to be careful of what, I'm not sure what you can all see, but they did this um, in order to ensure that no um, information was left, um, no records were left, which would either um, embarrass the British government, provide evidence of racism, or more crucially, lay them open to legal challenge. Um, and in Uganda, this was called Operation Legacy. And, um, which with no irony whatsoever. Um, and when I had the opportunity to make the exhibition at Savvy, what I ultimately chose to do was to present this file, which was declassified in 2013, alongside documentation of the Speak Centenary Festival exhibition, um, which was lavishly produced by the British government. Um, and one of the things it did was to provide a um, very affirmative um, narrative of the story of the close history of um, Britain and Uganda. So I'll stop there. Um, and if there are any questions or something, I can pick those up afterwards. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for sharing. It's definitely a very massive and very uh, um, rich material, uh, which is giving us lots of clues and lots of leads. And uh, yeah, I wish we will see, I will see the exhibition um, in the coming coming year somewhere uh, else. And when, when was it in Savi? In uh, just recently, right? No, it was yeah. in Savi in 2014 in the exhibition, Giving Contours to Shadows, which they did with the Neue Berliner Kunstverein. And then it's also been shown, it was shown in 2015, 2016 in Cairo at Contemporary Image Collection Collective in an exhibition called Greetings to Those Who Asked about me, which is about imprisonment. Yeah. 
Yeah, so it's, uh, but uh, like the way how you organize the archival materials, it gives um, like um, um, also pretty, pretty rich insight, uh, not only the actions of uh, British government, but also into the history of uh, uh, particular social media of uh, Uganda's, right? Well, I mean, it's, it's, I, I don't, I don't know if I'd make that claim for the, um, I don't know if I would make that claim for this particular aspect that looks at the prisons um, or the kind of, oh, actually, no, it doesn't even look at the prisons. It tries to investigate the biography of these photographs. Um, I think that's not necessarily true, but I think, um, I think that ultimately what became clear for me through this particular line of research that the prison photographs were actually a symptom of something greater, that to be obsessed with the story or the, um, the kind of genesis of this project was perhaps um, a bit of a red herring because the only reason that they're, prov the only reason there's so many of them, first of all, is because of how many other images were destroyed. So the reason that there's so many prison photographs is not because um, they mainly just photographs prisons, it's because they set fire to everything else. Um, and the fact that we know it's very difficult to find anything where are we now, since I first started looking at them coming up for 10 years, the reason we know so little about them is again, because the records that accompanied them were destroyed. And that actually, um, they're more interesting to me as a symptom of this, as a kind of, as an evidence of this process of, this systematic process of erasure than they are in and of themselves. Even though I think there is a lot of very interesting mileage in thinking about how a colonizer produces representations of its own prisons. Um, and particularly in the case of Uganda, because I started to research imprisonment. Most people were in prison in Uganda because of crimes against the colony, not crimes against the person. So if you got rid of colonialism, those prisons themselves wouldn't exist. Um, and they, so yeah, there's a, there's a lot of interesting things about those images, but I think what became much more meaningful was thinking about what those images, that what their, um, what their visibility conceals, I guess. Yeah, thank you. And um, um, we'll continue, uh, I guess, with uh, uh, more questions uh, to you and to Mina uh, later when uh, uh, Nina will present her work. And uh, um, I'd like to present Nina Statrup Larsen. And um, uh, she's an um, artist based in Amsterdam. And um, um, she's been, like, for many years, been working uh, and interested into in the relation on of economy, legal infra infrastructures, geopolitics, and the post-colonial presence. Uh, therefore, the nucleus of capital that I was really happy to, to curate and put together is a, is a really um, uh, an example of her practice when she's uh, uh, looking at different power and economical structure within uh, uh, within the European Union, but also looking at the connections or traces of colonial past in the present uh, territories of uh, uh, former colonies and how, um, how the idea of um, uh, decolonization is actually not happened completely, how we can find still in everyday um, processes, um, the traces of um, uh, uh, colonial past and the question of sovereignty of those uh, former colonies is still in questions which she's uh, uh, presenting and investigating and uh, really bringing uh, into public spotlight this matter through the CFA Franks currency and its connection to, uh, to, uh, to, the, e, uh, to, the, to the euro. Um, Nina works a lot with, uh, but putting all together of this of such uh, such massive research, she works a lot with documents, data, archival material, texts, video, and uh, and her works materialize in different editions of installations and also performances and uh, publications. 
Nina was a fellow of the Van Eyck Academy and also uh, she was a fellow of Academy of Schloss Solitude in Stuttgart. Um, uh, she was um, a resident of uh, the Cité uh, International uh, of Art in Paris and uh, worked for uh, various magazine, uh, magazines, the Grun, for instance, uh, in Amsterdam and the uh, she's a participant of various festivals um, in across Europe and also in Africa. And uh, her exhibition, um, um, uh, which became Nucleus of Capital, was also presented at the Bergen, uh, Bergen uh, Assembly in 2019. And um, I want to use the chance, of course, to bring attention to the exhibition and to look at the all materials we um, uh, collected so far for the online uh, viewing, but also uh, if you're based in, uh, in the Netherlands, you can, uh, you can uh, organize with us a professional viewing and see the exhibition offline. And uh, next week, we are also planning to, uh, uh, to release the, um, uh, the video, a new video which Nina uh, made for the uh, specifically for this exhibition and um, uh, Nina the floor is yours please um, um, uh, share with us um, uh, what you wanted to contribute to this um, uh, to this to the discussion today yeah uh, thank you Anya for this great uh, introduction it's uh, always a bit too much um, <laughs> and uh, and also thanks to to Post for hosting the exhibition and to the whole team there. It's been really a pleasure to work with them. Um, and also, of course, thanks to Nina and Emma for being here. I think it's um, it's always really humbling to deal with this type of material, and I'm always really impressed when I hear like I mean I know your work a bit uh, from before, and it's just always super interesting to, to hear. And uh, also in the sense of like, uh, let's say approaching a lot of these types of projects with a lot of humility and carefulness of like how to, um, on the one hand figure out, but also narrate and, and show uh, these things, like how can it be done um, in a way that gives access to the material, but also in a way still uh, maintains the complexity that it in many cases has. So, um, so I just to say that I really admire the, the works that you do. So it's um, nice to have you here. Um, as Anya said, like I'm, well, I've been doing several projects around uh, capital and sort of global uh, infrastructures of financial flows. And uh, I was also running a bank with a group of other artists for a while, and which was a sort of kamikaze project investigating this kind of, let's say, material, immaterial uh, aspects of what is this actually? Uh, what does it mean? Um, and then at a certain point while I was well, researching for another project, I was reading a, a blog from an Ivorian economist, uh, Mamadou Koulibaly, and um, which is, you know, when you do a deep dive online and, and dig up uh, a lot of things. And uh, he was uh, describing a lot of the aspects of the CFA Frank. Um, and I was quite surprised that I did not know about it. Um, and so I started to track uh, the things that he was talking about, but I could also see that he was being framed by French officials as somewhat of a conspiracy theorist, um, which was definitely not true. He was a very serious uh, economist. Um, so this was, 2015, something like this. Uh, and a lot has happened in the last five years in relation to public knowledge uh, of the CFA Frank, um, luckily. Uh, and a lot has happened also because of this um, public's access to knowledge about uh, this 
actually quite massive monetary infrastructure, which France set up uh, in its colonies um, and well maintained until now. And a, and a large part of that has simply been, let's say France reducing its own visibility uh, and, and presence within this monetary infrastructure. Um, at the moment, uh, several of the countries, particularly in West Africa, are in serious discussions to exit the CFA franc and form their own currency union called the ECO. Um, so let's say a lot, or it's extremely important that Europe and France in particular, but now also the European Union does not hinder this, um, which well has happened several times before. Um, I'm going to share my screen and go a little bit more into particularities. Um, so, um, just as a basics, so the CFA franc is this monetary infrastructure, um, colonial, neo-colonial, uh, currency, meaning the official money that, um, well, that 14 African states has. They have, it has two subsets, uh, the BESC and the BCEAU, so West and Central African states. Um, so France, um, well, when France set up the colonies, one of the things that was really clear was also that in order to <clears throat> maintain control, if you have control of all exchange, uh, meaning the currency, you have, of course, greater control. So they made existing uh, currencies for them, and there was a, a multiplicity of different types of currencies, but that were also objects. So bracelets, throwing knives, uh, a lot of iron objects, and also the quite known cowrie shells um, that were used across uh, the whole region. And so here you have some of these former or pre-colonial currencies uh, shown on CFA franc coins from 2005, which becomes a kind of weird loop of these uh, pre-colonial currencies returning uh, in 2005, on the one hand as a celebration, but on the other hand, also as completely kind of stripped uh, of what they used to be. Um, so one of the things that I've been doing in this research is to try to find materialities. Let's say capital is of course, a lot of abstraction uh, and materialities at the same time, but I've been, um, let's say, one thing that I've been doing is to collect the, the banknotes that have been uh, produced over the years, because of course, now we have the currencies. Um, let me go here. Um, the current existing series, uh, Central African states at the top and West African states at the bottom. Um, but of course, we don't see the overview of um, what this series is. You know, so these kind of flimsy pieces of paper. Um, but in that sense, banknotes are interesting because they are also the agent of this monetary infrastructure. They are also evidence, they're witness, but they're also a constitution of all this, let's say the French army, the French police, the French legal system. And since 2001, uh, the European Central Bank that they've been connected to since the Euro. Um, so they also become this like extremely powerful device. You know, there's all the violence that has come before this piece of paper and the violence that will follow if you disturb its integrity. I mean, it's not difficult to tear a piece of paper apart, um, but these ones you're, well, you're not allowed to take it. Um, and one of the things in terms of 
documents is this thing of, let's say that they are produced to be used. Legal documents, um, let's say abstracts, uh, the humane into information and data and into this bureaucracy that they constitute. Um, and uh, by people using them, they also become part of this uh, system, basically. So one of the things that I'm interested in is how to become, well, on the one hand, literate to the documents, uh, and can this reading or this different kind of literacy produce uh, different kinds of knowledge or different kinds of approach that, um, well, can make it more difficult for these documents to exist how the, the neo-colonial apparatus has produced them to be. Um, so this is a, an overview that I did with numismatic descriptions. So numismatism is this kind of strange field which in many ways is quite apolitical. So you have all of these uh, sort of official numismatic descriptions um, that tells us what is on these banknotes. So Paul oil refining or young African copper um, or mining activity in Gabon, palm oil cultivation. Um, and of course, when you see the sort of overview, there are of course different depictions. So it should be said that these are French engravers, French printers. The print facility is in uh, Chamalière, in the heart of France, at the sort of the main print facility of the French Central Bank. Um, so of course, also the representation is produced by the French, um, well, it's not too much to say the colonial case. So one of the early series here from 1946 uh, shows, for instance, um, French colonizers, seafarers and navigators. And they're some of the only, uh, let's say, faces of known people. So uh, here, portrait of Colbert, symbol of his maritime and commercial reforms, which were, of course, the colonial uh, managerial setup and, and settling. Otherwise, the uh, people of the African countries, Senegal, Togo, and so forth, are depicted uh, anonymously as, uh, it says, young African woman, foliage background. Um, and the foliage background is the French symbol or ornaments. Um, so there are these different periods of time um, and so here you have a, a series which is very exoticizing. So there are a lot of fruits and uh, exotic kind of scenery. Um, and when we go a little bit further and particularly after the decolonization period, then uh, the banknote shows a lot more industry um, and sort of sites of extraction. So mining activities, phosphate mining, um, uh, manganese mining, uh, timber export. So everything that can be exported to Europe, let's say, is depicted here. Um, but also kind of investment opportunities uh, like hydroelectric dams, which has been uh, built and has been kind of these sort of investment possibilities for European and well, Chinese uh, companies for a long time. So a lot of these uh, banknotes represent um, French assets in the region. Um, and I just want to maybe also touch on uh, something that Emma talked about or thing of destroying archives. And one of the cases that is also in the, in the video work, which is in the exhibition and that will also be online, um, is a case of the first uh, banknote of Guinea. So Guinea was one of the first uh, 
countries that gained independence in the region uh, led by President Sekou Touré. And he also wanted a full economic independence, meaning exiting the monetary union of the CFA franc, which France didn't want them to do. And uh, in order to put pressure uh, on all the other countries to remain within the CFA franc, they set up uh, what is called Operation Persil, which was a military, um, let's say, uh, what do you call it, operation. That, um, so one thing that they did was that when they left Guinea, was that then they destroyed all the infrastructure that they could get to. So archives, information, data, all of that, as well as cables, roads, uh, say all the things that France had invested in, in the colony, they didn't want uh, Guinea to benefit from that. Um, but another thing that they also did was that they took an example of uh, the newly independent Guinean currency series, they took it back to France, they copied it, they reprinted it, so faked it basically, they went back to Guinea and then they simply um, flooded the Guinean economy with uh, fake banknotes uh, in order to inflate this kind of already um, fragile new state economy. And of course, this was not the only thing that, um, let's say, made this very difficult for Guinea as a newly independent economy. But of course, all these things stacked together becomes very problematic. Um, so of course, also this, this, let's say the banknote as a well, necropolitical device that as this paper gets militarized and injected into uh, a war situation, basically. Guinea later on, some years later, actually in 86, 1986, we joined the CFA Frank. Um, and in the decolonization period, no other countries left the CFA Frank because it was a condition for peaceful transitioning into independence that they would stay. Um, so this is one of the reasons that you still have 14 African states in this uh, CFA Frank monetary zone. Um, there's a lot more that I can say, but I can also maybe just um, go through this diagram. So uh, one of the myths that France have been very successful at convincing everybody of is that um, they are the warranters of the, of the currency union and that basically uh, it would be extremely bad for these economies if they would leave that they can't manage on their own without a Western European uh, state taking care of things for them. Um, but if we look back over the last uh, 60 years, there has been uh, around, uh, I think, 100 uh, exits from currency unions. And a lot of them has been during the time of decolonization. So there is actually a data set took over in the sense of, is it true that they would be worse off without the protection uh, in citations of France? Um, and so this is the, the list. And so you have the, the year of the exit, the country that departed, and the anchor, so the, the country that had the, the monetary region. Um, and when you look at that, uh, and see how these states are doing now compared to the countries within the CFA region, you can see that it's actually not true. Like they did not enter into complete um, voluntary fragile economies. Most of them were okay um, and have better economic uh, stability now after this. Um, there's a, there's a lot to say uh, around all of this. Um, and, well, I where I could go on, but uh, I also just want to show a few images of the installation at uh, POST. 
So I'm showing the collection of the banknotes that are, um, well, haunting, I would say, when you look at them in totality. Uh, there are also a lot of these diagrams. Um, there is the, this is a, a diagram, there's also a text, but uh, that deals with how the member states have to deposit all of their foreign reserve in the French treasury. So the foreign reserve is the gold, it's all, it's the safe, it's the vault of a state, uh, bonds, uh, foreign currency, gold, etc. That they have to deposit in the French treasury. Uh, France can then reinvest that and basically the profit of that goes into uh, paying off French state debt. So in 2021 you have 14 African states directly indirectly paying off uh, French public debt. Uh, they can sort of borrow back uh, their own money as uh, framed as sort of development aid. It's a loan and they have to pay it back to the French uh, treasury with five to six percent interest. This is a bit of an example of, let's say, the economic policy behind the banknotes, that the banknotes is a sort of visual front of. Um, there is a lot more of that, but um, these are some of the things that are there. Um, in the exhibition, there's also the, the video work, which is, um, let's say, trying to look also at the, the production of the banknotes, let's say, the, the cutting of the lines of the motifs, the drawing, drawing understood in, let's say, different ways, drawing of capital, um, and the pressure, the continuous pressure of the printing press to sort of reinscribe a colonial ideology onto these pieces of paper, this ongoing machine, um, which is also why I'm always very careful of, of talking about a colonial past, um, because it sounds like it's so far away, you know, it's over now, because for so many different Elements, it's not. A lot of it is really still present under new names, under new policies, um, uh, and well, and uh, of course now, let's say since 2001 and two, the CFA franc has been pegged to the euro, which means that it has become this kind of official sub currency to the euro, meaning that the economic policy of the euro also has to, uh, or let's say, uh, is also effectuated in the Western Central Africa um, CFA zones. Uh, you also see that literally on the banknotes in their uh, color schemes, uh, in the security features that are the same as on the euro. Um, okay, I will stop here because this is, of course, um, continues, um, but yeah, I think that I'm interested in how, let's say these official documents of power, of how we can become uh, more literate to them and maybe act, let's say against the documents through finding ways to read them, let's say to de-abstract them and to kind of um, yeah, act against them in a way that we can dismantle them. And maybe we can have other documents as well. Um, yeah, thanks. Mm. Yeah, thank you very much, Nina. Um, can, can you see me? I don't know, something at some point, something happened with my, uh, everything went into one direction. Yeah, thanks a lot for uh, bringing like extra layers of details to, uh, to, the, uh, to the project. And I'm really happy that the project actually um, uh, for the first time being able to, uh, to show in the Netherlands because the colonial discourse or post-colonial discourse is a very active in the country. And I think that kind of aspect never being touched upon. So it's, uh, it's really interesting also like tool and channel of how else we can to, we can, we can tackle the, um, uh, the, uh, 
um, uh, post-colonial conditions of uh, uh, of Europe, and uh, and I think uh, 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 what is um, uh, I mean what is very interesting about your practice, but also about practice of Mina and um, and Emma, is that it's really tend to extend uh, the possibilities of uh, forensic or possibilities of evidences that you all working with, whether it's a, a banknotes or it's a found um, uh, found photographs, or if it's a uh, any kind of traces of um, 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 uh, of fascism on the paved stone, it's all evidences that are all in a way to um, um, aim or um, uh, you in your practice, you aim to articulate this uh, uh, contemporary notions of public truth through all your uh, uh, all your practices. And uh, so I think, um, it's a kind of that's what uh, what really unites you, and uh, of course there are so many artists that working with the past, with the uh, memory, the uh, politics of memory, but this um, um, uh, uh, really work with um, evidences um, in a in a way that uh, uh, you you really try to incorporate it into contemporary processes is uh, is very interesting, and uh, yeah, thank you, thank you very much, and. Uh, um, uh, we might have some questions or um, uh, maybe you guys also have um, some questions to each other because I think I've been talking too much already. So please. Mm, okay, maybe I will say something because um, I, and this is actually from, I think last time when, so we were in Bergen together uh, like a world uh, event ago, you know, <laughs> before all of this happened. But, um, and I remember a conversation that I had with you, Emma, because um, we were talking about research and, and how to, what well, all these things of like how to deal with this. And, and I don't exactly remember how it came up, but I remember that you mentioned this, the, the scavenger methodology which I really enjoyed and I've been thinking a lot about it since um, because there is this notion about um, and it's of course also related to situated knowledges by Donna Haraway and, and this whole thing of how to expand the, the narrative field um, but also how to do it actually in practice and, and I think maybe you can talk a little bit more about it <laughs> also because... Um let's say the, but the idea of it, but this thing of, let's say, because on the one hand, a lot of these histories, I mean, as we've shown now, there are a lot on documents, right? But mm -hmm. it's hidden in plain sight. And then there are all the documents that are not there. And then the ones that you have, how do you actually read them? Or how do you begin to access them? And yeah, but, but yeah. The, the scavenger, which I also really uh, can identify with. Well, if you if you can, if I, to do justice to scavenger methodology, which is a genuine theoretical terminology, um, I can just run next door to where the quote is pinned on the wall, and then I can bring it back, so I can say it properly on the record. So if you can talk amongst yourselves for two seconds, I'll go and get it and come back. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, but. Um... But what do you mean uh, uh, by scavenging methodology? It's um, um, some sort of a, a term invented by Emma, or it's appropriated. She will get it. But maybe say, like, but so the scavenger, let's say, as an animal. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, well, the animal that eats everything basically, um, and and looks everywhere for all kinds of different. 
materials to test uh, and eat uh, and so on, living or dead uh, material. Uh, but you know, in this case, I actually was, uh, while you all three were talking, I think like each of yours practice is very territorial, but territorial, not necessarily connected to the physical space, right? Geography, but it's territorial differently, territorial towards uh, processes. I don't think, I, I think you are kind of, uh, there is a there is a um, uh, continuity, like uh, Emma goes through the kind of this global uh, scanning, global process processes of, uh, of colonialism. And, uh, and I think it's very different in Britain and Norway, for instance, but somehow she develops some sort of a, some sort of um, a toolbox for that, right? Which, uh, which I guess um, uh, uh, could, be, uh, um, could, be, could be used for uh, maybe also for people in uh, doing, uh, that doing colonial studies as well as uh, expand their possibilities of learning about this or unlearning really. Well, I mean, I know colonial, colonial historians to my experience are actually quite fine doing history in the old fashioned way. Okay. And don't have a lot of, um, yeah, don't have a lot of interest. Um, I think particularly, I mean, it's, I mean, I, I want to come back because I think it is important to talk about. Um, or maybe I am. Maybe I am answering the question. Okay. Well, first of all, let's get scavenger methodology out of the way. Um, <laughs> let's get that out of the way. Um, the term, as I understand it, comes from uh, a, a writer theorist called um, Judith Halberstam, um, who wrote a book called Female Masculinity that was published in 1998. And I quote, um, a queer methodology in a way is a scavenger methodology that uses different methods to collect and produce information on subjects who have been deliberately or accidentally excluded from traditional studies of human behavior. The queer methodology attempts to combine methods that are often cast as being at odds with each other and it refuses the academic compulsion towards disciplinary coherence. So it's, um, it's a very, it's, I mean, I find it very useful. I mean, I think just to sort of, um, to come back to this idea, just to dwell briefly on scavenging. Scavenging, as I understand the English word, um, is, for example, is what you do, say, after the harvest. So the combine harvester or the, um, what's it called? The combine, the combine harvester or the main um, group of agricultural laborers come through and they collect all of the grain at the harvest. And then you have the people who, I mean, even Van, they're in that Van Gogh painting, the gleaners who come along and they, they pick through the stalks, the refuse to see if there's anything there that can be eaten, can be used, um, can be recuperated by people who don't have resources. Um, so scavenging is going through um, what has been discarded um, to see if there's something of use. So, um, and I think it is a very useful, um, it's a very useful way, I think, to think about, um, I, think, I think it's quite apposite for some of the things that I look at, um, which are often, as in the case of these colonial prison photographs, is actually a very obscure, um, very peripheral, um, of absolutely no interest to the UK National Archive, I'd like to stress. Um, they really didn't understand why I was interested in these photographs at all. Um, but if you, but if you kind of pick a bit from here, and then I have a chance encounter in a library, and I discover a catalogue, and then go on a long journey to try and find out about the catalogue, and then this brings me to something else, and then through this, these through these little traces. Um, it then something becomes clear or um, that thing being that the ability to um, narrate or re-narrate 
the history of British colonialism in what is now Uganda has been, um, has been fundamentally undermined in perpetuity by the destruction of the main bodies. So what you have in a way in the UK National Archive is the detritus, is the leftovers after this um, massive act of destruction. So, yeah, I mean, it, it is, you know, and I think it, it is, you know, it's about, it, it, you get into sort of um, less, less straightforward territory in the sense that you talk to this person, you see this thing, you happen to catch this. It's not, it's, it is for the coincidences and relationships are very um, key to these processes of discovery. Um, I mean, what I would say, I mean, this is also why people like me are not taken seriously by historians. Um, it's very, it's a, it's a legitimacy of the kinds of knowledges that I, I may perhaps be trying to produce is compromised by its lack of disciplinary coherence, um, its standards of truth, regimes, all of these things. I mean, the, the kind of, um, the, this is the last thing, I'm, I'm gonna stop talking in a second, um, but the, the kind of watchword or the kind of abiding inspiration for me is the South African historian Premesh Lalu, um, whose book, um, The Deaths of Hintza, Post-Apartheid South Africa and the Shape of Recurring Pasts has had a transformative impact on my um, understanding of what it is that I do or how I might be thought of as contributing to what knowledge that's in the public domain. Um, Premesh Lalu caused a huge controversy um, with his book, Deaths of Hintza. Um, his argument is that um, the discipline of history, historiography, was complicit in the project of apartheid. Though, so therefore, if you want to write history after apartheid, you need a different kind of history. That means having a different, a, a different set of criteria, a different set of, um, a different, a different way of assessing or evaluating truth, and it's also to embrace and to engage. Um, I hope I'm not paraphrasing him badly, but to embrace wholeheartedly the archive as an aesthetic project, history as an aesthetic project. Um, and he has done, and the book, The Death of Hintza, um, addresses the very famous um, killing and beheading of a Kosa chief called Hintza, about which there are many different narratives, which were all very um, foundational in terms of a particular narrative of um, colonialism and uh, I suppose settler colonial state building in the 19th century at the time of the Truth and Reconciliation Committees Commission in the, in the late 90s, um, a Kosa Hila announced that he had returned from Scotland with the skull of Hintza. He announced this and was widely vilified um, that Lalu takes this moment, this man's claim as a way to rethink this history. And I've just, um, I find his work, I mean, it's a, it's a beautiful book. It's a very, very excellent book, but it's really, I suppose, given me a level of confidence in thinking that, well, I don't, if, if, if by extension, if, you know, if, 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 if historiography is complicit in apartheid, it is therefore by extension also in colonialism, apartheid being a kind of end point of the settler colonial project. Therefore, there is a value, or there might be a value or a meaning in the kinds of processes and the kinds of um, modes of engagement that I'm pursuing. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, uh, Good. Now, now you'll just smile. <laughs> <laughs> well, but like, uh, you know, high five. That's it. Yeah, and just smile. But yeah, Judith Halberstam, Feminist Masculinities, 1998. Premesh Lalu, The Deaths of Hintza. I think it's 2000 and 
I can't remember the year. Yeah. Uh, but uh, Mina, what about uh, what about you? Like your uh, your journey within this um, uh, pretty diverse in a way in a way uh, themes within the um, uh, history of um, of Finland and present of Finland goes from neo Nazi to uh, to um, 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 history of um, um, uh, like nation building, right? Nationalism and uh, also this uh, uh, very beautiful project that uh, I very much like you did with together with Ahmed Al Nawaz Festival 1962 about absolutely forgotten events uh, uh, that happened uh, in in the city and uh, being completely erased from history of the city and history of the country. How do you? Um, place your interest i mean they're all kind of around the um, uh, the history of um, uh, which i guess you know uh, a lot about and question all the time how do you move within this uh, uh, same geography but very diverse um, uh, pool of subjects in a way mm, uh, yes uh, i don't know really like somehow uh, it's it's a bit difficult to to always to 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 kind of to to remember where kind of I get somehow uh, you know like I, I I think I'm reading quite a lot the same books which are this kind of I would say the uh, well now when I'm based in Helsinki <laughs> since the last uh, a bit more than ten years. Uh, it somehow makes a lot of sense for me to deal with the local history of here quite a lot. Also because um, I see that there is so much that uh, that uh, has not been addressed and uh, and somehow it's, uh, it's somehow all the time some kind of a battlefield or like when I open the main newspaper here I always get angry because the way they speak about the history and 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 somehow like there is all the time this this need uh, to 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 speak about these other histories that have taken place and other perspectives and um, yeah I don't know I I I I read these books which are written from a different perspective I would say from a more leftist perspective than the national official history in Finland and uh, and. Uh, and somehow, uh, I guess, like that, the more I have gone into this, these particular histories, that the more kind of these things just come up, like um, um, these topics. And so, uh, I, I definitely find very useful this this uh, Emma, what you were and uh, Nina pointing out this scavenger methodology and queer methodology i really like this very much and uh, uh yeah i I, remi- I remember the beautiful film by agnes varda the cleaners uh, which is wonderful and uh, yeah I, I i yeah i also think that yeah perhaps we artists sometimes artists who then pick up that which is discarded and uh, and for example i was uh, the first image I was showing was this horrible swastika uh, payment. And uh, uh, you see this swastika here quite a lot in Helsinki. And, uh, but, but when I was um, yeah, around 2012, 13, 14, um, looking more into this uh, topic of swastika in Finland and speaking with historians and historians who are writing about the, the silenced uh, Nazi past of Finland, for example, uh, like really interesting historians. And, and I would ask them about the swastika and they are like, well, like I never considered that. It's not interesting. And uh, somehow I find that quite amazing that, that somehow something like this, like a symbol like swastika somehow falls in between that, that the historians are not interested in that because it's just a symbol. 
and and then nobody else is touching it because it has a different explanation why it exists here. But I don't believe in that explanation, and I have actually proven that that explanation is it's wrong. You can throw it to rubbish. But uh, yeah, and and still today, uh, it seems that that I am actually the only one in Finland who has written the history of this swastika all the way up to the 19th century, because they only say that it came to Finland in uh, 1918, although it came already in 1889. So, so I remember your ex, I remember seeing this work with the drawing with the books, with the school books, which was in Vienna at ah, the okay. Art Academy. Um, okay. I remember, cause that was when it was, I hope I'm not describing it wrong it was in children's drawing books or where were no no, no. it there was actually designs it, yeah no they were crossword puzzles crossword puzzles yes. yeah in in a weekly political uh, neutral weekly of finland uh, a bit like the times or their spiegel mm -hmm. this kind of but but it was uh, during during the wartime from 1939 mm -hmm. until 19 44, very many of them were playing with the swastika shape. And after the war, they changed. They became much more ornamental and mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of folkloristic. But it, it's interesting that even there, like not to mention the other pages of those weekly magazines, but even there, they were really mm -hmm. like dripping with, uh, with fascism. So. Yeah, but I mean, that's, I think that's, I think what you're touching on, and I think this is, this also perhaps, is a reflection of why um, why proper historians with a capital H aren't so interested is necessary to think about the kind of sensory, um, aesthetic or kind of libidinal dimensions of power, you know, and the relation and the and pleasure actually as well. Um, that there is this kind of sensory dimension that's at play um, that's perhaps, which, which in many ways continues unbroken. So mm -hmm. thinking about, for example, the imagery that you presented on these banknotes, the way in which, what's the kind of aesthetic regime, what's at play here, what's, um, how does it make you feel? and that this image, this question of kind of our, um, our, our literacy in the visual or aesthetic um, registers of uh, power um, is not something that um, I think that many of us, many people have dealt with other than at its most kind of spectacular. So whether that's like hey, the Nuremberg rallies or Leni Riefenstahl to take a very kind of colossal example or to use another maybe more soft power version, say the opening ceremony of the Olympic games. Um, you know, these are the kind of spectacular examples, but there's a very insidious process. And, and it's, not, it's not necessarily insidious in the sense of that nobody knows, because it begins with quite deliberate agendas, but the ways in which sort of ideas and feelings um, are filtered through into through processes of cultural consumption um, that often evades purview. Um, or by the time we reach them now, um, we don't necessarily know where it's come from. You know, like we like associating certain kinds of, no. sorry, Nina, please talk. I've talked enough. No, but, but it's this thing of like how to actually decode these aesthetic uh, sites uh, mm -hmm. in a way that, um, that in a way that we've, you know, grown up with in, in so many ways that, you know, they're part of the furniture somehow. Um, but they're still, I don't know, sites that we exist on. Mm -hmm. With and if we don't know how to, I mean, if we don't know what they are and why, mm. they are, then it becomes 
extremely problematic to shift or to have a different kind of present or mm -hmm. if you that matter. Um, yeah. And well, if, if, if only because in many cases they still have contemporary currency, they well, still have contemporary value. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's a reason to take to say, say the African continent as an example. How many places have you ever seen an advertisement for a holiday in Africa that included images of a city? Hardly. It, it never happened, apart from Cape Town, which has been carefully sanitized for Western consumption. Um, you never. So. The idea that there, there is no, this kind of, it's, there's no urban infrastructure apart from these dislocated pockets of people living in desperate circumstances in war zones. Um, the rest of the continent is, yeah. And because it still has a value and it has a value even to those countries because that's how they, that's how they get their tourist dollars. I think that's also, um, that's also part of the reason I think it's hard to unpick them is because in many cases um, there could you continue to get a return on investing on some of those things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I guess there is a kind of a, um, yeah, there is a kind of necessity for this um, visual or infrastructural literacy, right? To sort of uh, be able um, to have this. Um, Oculus on uh, on on seeing those processes, and mm. uh, of course, it's a knowledge which is trained and knowledge which is uh, really um, require many different uh, expertise as well. So that's a kind of very um, uneasy process, which uh, is very difficult to integrate into simplified uh, structures, right? Like education or history as a science or discipline or other things. I'm sorry? Or even art for that. Even, yes, even art. I mean, yeah. I, mean I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say necessarily. I mean, I think that the, I think cultural studies has done an amazing, um, has made, I mean, visual culture, I come and go a little bit with visual cultures. Um, but I think cultural studies certainly as we, I think has, done a great job of bringing together the image, um, consumption, capital, as a way to kind of think these things together. And it's, um, it's definitely that that's informed me, that history of, um, let's look at this contemporary image, what meanings are associated with it now? Where does, what are its antecedents? Can we trace them back? What is its connection to capital? What's the economics? going on, what sort of, what's happening with gender. I find it's a very, it's a very useful tool book still. Um, I mean, but it's not, a, you know, I mean, you can study cultural studies now. That's a thing you can do in some places. Um, and I think the methodologies of cultural studies have also permeated. So you find them in art criticism and art history. I think you people draw on that to greater or lesser extent. Um, you know, and, and in other kinds of history, but it's still a marginal, it's still a marginal practice because in, in much the same way that something like post-colonial theory doesn't respect any disciplinary boundaries, I don't think cult studies does really either. And that's, that's complicated when it comes to the allocation of resources. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Uh, okay, ladies, we've been talking more than one and a half hour. I wish we could maybe one day um, embark on a like a longer, longer dialogue and uh, uh, personal exchange and intellectual exchange. Uh, in spite of the fact of uh, being critical towards academia and maybe particular discipline and historians, I want to announce our next public pro, uh, public event, which is, I hope, give us a give us a good uh, a good inspiration of actually uh, be in dialogue with scientists. So next uh, next event, um, Nina and I will be in a conversation. I mean, maybe maybe Nina, uh, may, mainly Nina, with two scientists, uh, scientists, sociologists that wrote a book recently ab about uh, history of European integration, mainly about notion of uh, Eurafrica, which uh, Nina is uh, using a lot uh, as a part of her uh, research project. It's um, 
uh, uh, largely forgotten notion, which was uh, circulating among um, um, uh, politicians uh, of, um, uh, of uh, European countries in order to find different managerial mechanisms to manage uh, uh, their colonies. Uh, then it was um, um, executed partly in the, in the post-war period. And uh, I mean, we can see traces of that now still in uh, West uh, and Central Africa in relation to CFA Frank. So um, uh, we thought that would be interesting to talk with people uh, that actually wrote a book and conducted very extensive research, not mentioning CFA Franks in their book though. Uh, so the um, um, uh, uh, Peo Hansen and uh, Stephen Johnson wrote the book uh, called um, Your Africa, the untold history of European integration and colonialism in 1916. And um, uh, we're gonna conversate with them or, or next week on uh, 12th of uh, uh, May, uh, also at five um, uh, Amsterdam time, at five o'clock Amsterdam time, uh, time and the conversation, I mean, the, the title of the talk will be Forgotten Institutional Arrangement of European Integration. Um, so we zooming in a bit. The forming of the EU, basically, uh, and, and yeah. a book and, and a work that put a lot of things in relation to European uh, history into place for me. And I, let's say, mobilized this concept of your Africa that they excavated in relation to the CFA thing, uh, which and, and they hadn't really thought up a, about it. And that may, may be also kind of links to some of these gaps between disciplines. But other than that, it, it's a really fantastic book that, that um, was recommended to me actually by Sven Lütteken, who's a Netherlands-based theorist also. And, um, but yeah, so I definitely recommend it and I hope that people will join uh, next week. Yeah. So thank you so very much, everyone. It was very interesting to, uh, to talk to you and to exchange, to learn more about your practice and get to know you um, uh, through screens, to see your face, Mina, because uh, I haven't seen you for a while. We've been, we've been collaborating before in Helsinki. And uh, uh, Emma was absolutely fantastic to exchange some thoughts with you. Nina, thank you so much. I will see you soon. So uh, uh, yeah, and thank you, uh, Yuri and Herda and all team of POST for being patient and stay with us and facilitating this conversation. It's always too short, right? There's so much. Yes, it's always too short. <laughs> For sure, but maybe next time that will be good. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for uh, to our audience who was with us uh, in Zoom and, and uh, on YouTube. Uh, thanks a lot, and now uh, uh, we'll continue scavenging uh, different uh, uh, urgent political matters. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Bye, bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.